Christ whom thou hast sent. And over the course of our studies, we have the opportunity to learn how to build up our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ as we come to consider the man Christ Jesus. And so we very much look forward to the words of our brother Anthony Still tonight and over the rest of his studies, God willing. Tonight, our brother Anthony will be speaking to the subject, recognising the man, and we'll read together Revelation chapter 1 as an introduction to his study, and our brother Isaac Harmonis will lead us in that reading. Brother Isaac. Reading Revelation 1. The revelation of Jesus, Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven ecclesias which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patma, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven ecclesias which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive for evermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of, and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. 
the seven stars are the angels of the seven ecclesias, and the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven ecclesias. Well, thank you, Brother Isaac, for that reading. We now look forward to the words of our brother Anthony, to the theme, The Man Christ Jesus, and tonight's subject, Recognising the Man, Brother Anthony. I'll just type this mic back because it'll make a little bit of noise. And hopefully it's still on. Good. We don't know very much about what the Lord Jesus Christ would look like. So that if he was to wander past us while we're sitting on that bench, how would we recognize him? And how would we know to call him across to the chair so that we could talk to him? And you know, this year, young people and brothers and sisters, we've probably had the biggest study program that was based around the Lord Jesus Christ for many years. The suburban young people's classes have been on Hebrews, which has exposed to us Christ's supremacy, his supremacy as a son, as a prophet, as a priest, greater than Adam, greater than the law, greater than Moses, greater than Aaron. And so we've considered that book of Hebrews over the whole of this year's program. The northern youth groups looked at the eight signs of John, where we've considered the eight miracles that are there and the activity that the Lord and the teaching of the Lord around that. At Woodville, we've had our special effort on the subject of the Lord in the law of Moses. We've had the ACBM concert, which was about Messiah. We've had the combined weekend, that one man should die for the people, speaking of the last few days of Jesus' mortal life. And now we're coming to do another study on the man Christ Jesus. So what type of study will this one be? compared to those that we've already heard. Well, it's not going to be primarily about Jesus' teaching. 
It's not going to be primarily about his miracles. It's not going to be about the history of the events of his life. It's not going to be about Old Testament prophecies of his, of the first and second advent. It's not going to consider the types of the Lord. And despite just having read Revelation chapter 1, it's not going to be a study of his letters and his writings in detail. In many ways, it'll touch on all of those things. What we want to do is a character study of Jesus so that we can understand who he is as a person and therefore have a closer personal relationship as Brother Steve introduced our studies with, with him. Now, a character study for Jesus actually has a few challenges. In a lot of cases, you've all already got your own impressions as to what the character of the Lord Jesus Christ is like. And hopefully we can add to that. But that might be a challenge for us. Character studies often rely on smaller sections of Scripture because you don't have time to look at the events and the character of the people that belong to them. A smaller amount of biblical material... For The character study of Jesus. He's still alive. He's still alive. And not only that, he's listening. I'll just flick past this one. The Lord Jesus Christ said that where there were two or three gathered together, there am I gathered in the midst of them. With great responsibility for us to be very careful about what we consider in this study of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if he's listening to me, and hopefully you will too, if he's listening to me, he's also aware of how you're responding and thinking about the things that are being presented about him. He might, we might imagine this as a way of keeping our focus on the study. If you're sitting next to an empty chair, imagine that's the one that he's chosen for tonight. And he's sitting there and he's interested in how interested you are in him and in him as a person, and meeting him, and speaking with him, and sitting on the chair together, and sharing our thoughts. So there's two main ideas we want to cover across the series of these six studies. Will we recognize him? Do we know what he's like? And we hope to see that. And secondly, what will we talk about with him? So let's start off then by thinking about how we're going to recognize him. What were his likes, his dislikes? Who were his heroes? How did he like to spend his time? And we can't look up his Facebook page because there isn't one there for us to look at. Otherwise, we would be able to see where he likes spending time with. There's no photographs there so that we can see who he likes to share that time with or what he, what he, what he likes or what his favourite things are. And there's no at real Jesus Christ Twitter feed that we could look at either to find out what his opinions were about various things. And we don't have a LinkedIn account to see who he follows or what he's been reading lately. The only source of material we have is the Bible, so we're going to deal with that, of course. But we have no physical description by which we could recognise him. In short, in some of the prophecies, perhaps of the Song of Solomon and some passages in Isaiah, some can see some physical descriptions of our Lord, but there's not one of the eyewitnesses of the Gospels that give us any description of what the Lord looked like so that we could hope to recognise him. So how do we try to bring him and personalise him into this frame? Well, I'd just like you to continue to think of this chair, and we'll leave it here as the reminder all the way through our studies. We'll put, it, we'll put that chair there. And we'll put the picture frame so that we could imagine what the portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ might be that we get to see. And we imagine ourselves sitting there next to him, learning about that. We even, apparently, in Scripture, have contradicting accounts of what he actually did look like. And we have got one here in, uh, Matthew, in sorry, Isaiah 53, 
There shall grow up before him as a tender plant, a prophecy of the Lord, as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. And this is Isaiah 53, which speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ in his most desperate days. But there it says there's no beauty that we should desire him. We could lay that next to Psalm 45, verses 1 to 2, where we get a different picture. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king in his day of glory. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore, God hath blessed thee forever. How can someone be both uncomely and beautiful and fairer than the children of men, as those two passages might be? Well, of course, this is telling us that the Lord Jesus Christ isn't necessarily attractive from a physical perspective. He's not someone that we would look to follow after because of what he looks like, but because of his character, grace poured into his lips. The glory of God, which was revealed in him, full of grace and truth, as John says in John chapter 1. But fortunately, you know, in this chapter, in Revelation chapter 1, the Lord Jesus Christ has given us a self-portrait. He's given us a portrait of how he wants us to think about him. And he wants us to think about him in particular ways and in particular, um, um, particular visions. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 13 to 18, which Brother Isaac just read for us, we have a vision here where John saw one like the Son of Man. You see verse 12, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And all the way down to verse 18, we have a description of one like the Son of Man, which the, which the Apostle John here is seeing. Now, Brother Roberts gives us a, a quick description of, of what this is about. The Son of Man then seen by John when he turned to see the source of the voice was, was not the actual Jesus. He didn't actually have his eyes on fire and his feet locked as if they were burning in a furnace. He didn't really have a sword hanging out of his mouth. It's a symbolic representation of him. And so this is the way the Lord would have us think about him. The vision is actually about Jesus. Now, it has multiple purposes, of course. And we'll consider in the last study how the vision actually also relates to us altogether as part of him, as part of the body of Christ. But this is a picture in these verses of what Jesus wants to show himself as so that we can become like him. He demonstrates in this, in this vision what he wants us to think about him like. And if we understand it, if we apply it, then we'll recognise him and he'll recognise us because he will see himself in us. And we will become like him. Now we've already... Now my slides don't seem to be in the same order as I thought they were going to be. So just uh, as, a, as an introduction there, you see, these are the subjects that we've got for our, our six studies together. And you can see next to them the element, elements individually out of Revelation chapter 1 here uh, that we're going to cover off. And tonight we're going to look briefly at the white robes and the sword that was coming out of the Lord's mouth to see what it was that he wanted us to understand these visions to mean. And we'll put that up on each class so you can see how far we've progressed. So let's come back to this passage. Brother Stephen mentioned it at the start. This is life eternal to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. From the lovely prayer of our Lord in John chapter 17. And if you look up Vine's expository dictionary and have a look at this word know here, it tells us that it can indicate a relationship between the thing known and the person knowing. And in this case, it's a relationship between disciples and God and Jesus. It means to have knowledge from the perspective of relationship, not just from the perspective of research. It's possible to research what the Lord was prophesied to be and what he's prophesied to become. But that passage says that we have to have knowledge based on relationship, a relationship with Jesus. Now, we cannot have a relationship with Jesus with the Jesus of the past. We can't have a relationship with the Jesus of the past because we didn't live then. And we can't have a relationship with the Jesus in the future today because we're not in the future yet and he hasn't returned. So we've got to have a relationship with the Jesus of today, with Jesus as he is now. That's the only way we can have a relationship with somebody. In the past, 
Jesus is revealed as a prophet. You see this? This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world from John 6. In the past, that was the role that Jesus filled when he was here on the earth as a, as a, as a prophet. In the future, Revelation 11 tells us that he's going to come and reign forever and ever. He's going to be a king. So he was a prophet in the past. He's going to be a king in the future. What is he now? Well, we know that he's now a priest. And the writer of Hebrews here describes him as the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. And we are called there to consider him. He's considered as a priest. That's the role that he has now, is the role of a priest. And that's really revealed to us here in Revelation chapter 1 by almost the first description that we've got of him in verse 13. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot. And you would know from considering the Old Testament that garments down to the feet were what the priests had to wear. They needed to do that because they needed to cover up themselves as fleshly creatures to demonstrate that they were working on behalf of the holiness of God. They had fine linen, white garments that reached down to the foot. So here is our Lord Jesus Christ presenting him to us, presenting himself to us in, its, in his first characteristic as the priest, the role of the mediator. Later in Revelation, he, he has this, much the same description, but he's wearing crowns because he's moved into the phase of his role as a king. But for now, he's a priest. And not really surprising because this letter, the book of Revelation, is written to those that are in their life experience now where we need a priest, where we are waiting for him to return, but we need a mediator to help bring us to God. There's another clue, of course, there in verse 13. He's standing in the midst of the seven lampstands. And the lampstands were tabernacle or temple furniture in the holy place into which area none but the priests were able to go. No other than the priests could go there. And so that's where this, Lord Jesus, this image of the Lord Jesus Christ is standing, in the holy place. And that's why we've chosen as our title for this study series, The Man Christ Jesus, because we want to understand how we have a relationship with our Lord as a priest and a mediator. Here's the words of the Apostle Paul to Timothy. God will have all men to be saved. That's his purpose, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. His role as a priest now is the one that we can experience and come to know personally. And therefore, the goal of our studies is to understand him, to strengthen our personal relationship with God through him. And hopefully that means that when he does come and gather us all together with him and sits down with us, that we'll be looking forward to meeting him and he'll be looking forward to meeting us. What will we talk to Jesus about? What could we talk to Jesus about? You know, the Lord was a, a remarkably interesting, a remarkably interesting man. And he appears to have been remarkably interested in everything that was going on in, in and around his life. He knew about everything. Whatever sphere of life or study that you could think of, or as young people you might actually be studying now, he probably had an interest in. And we can probably find evidence of that interest in the scripture. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to flick through a whole series of pictures on the screen just with one or two words as a heading of them. And these are all drawn from the things that the Lord spoke about. There are passages down on the left hand side if, for those of you that want to see the evidence of that. You won't have time to write them all down. I'm sorry. We're going to just flick them through very quickly. But through the gospels these are the sort of things that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about and had knowledge of. And if any of you are interested in any of them then that's at least a start for your conversation that you could have with him. So let's kick it off. We know that he was able to speak about agriculture. Many of the parables are in that sphere. He spoke about animal husbandry and the need to take the animals out to water or to bring the shep for the shepherd to bring them home, uh, on the lost sheep on the shoulder. He talked about other parts of the animal kingdom and where they lived and the foxes that have holes in their dens. He spoke about botany and the need for the seed to go into the ground before it actually be able to grow up and to shoot into another shape. We know that he was experienced in carpentry because he had that role as the carpenter of Nazareth. And we know that he probably understood what it liked to get sawdust in your eye from the parable of the beam and the moat. 
These are things that the Lord knew about, and he knew about them at a depth that he could discuss them with the people in his day. He knew about the current events, the, the, the things that had occurred in his world, the Tower of Siloam that had fallen down and as a tragedy killed many people. He spoke about a lot, a lot of times of the domestic sphere, and particularly a domestic sphere of poverty. He knew that you patched garments, and therefore obviously was aware of those that didn't have the wealth to just buy another one. The Lord knew about these things. Potentially, this, this picture really helped me actually because you wouldn't put a lamp under a bushel, would you? Be a fire risk. Leave aside the fact that you wouldn't get the light out anywhere. But the Lord knew about these things in a domestic sphere. He knew about economics and accounting and tax treatments. For those of you that might be studying uh, in, in the field of finance, he came from a big family and spoke about the interrelationships of brothers and sisters. He knew about these spheres of life. He understood horticulture and when you should expect to see the figs on the tree because the leaves were there. He knew about international affairs and the fact that it would be better to send an ambassador than to create a war. He knew about law and the process by which a person would be sued and delivered to the officer and the officer to the judge and the judge to the prison. He knew all of these things, brothers and sisters and young people. He healed more people than any other doctor, I'm sure, ever. And therefore, I'm sure we could put medicine down as a factor of his knowledge. He knew about meteorology and the signs of the red sky at night that would bring good weather or otherwise in the morning and the south wind that would blow hot. He knew about all manner of occupations. His parables are full of shepherds and farmers and people who work from home, etc. He knew about politics and the interplay of the different levels of rulers and how they would, and how they would work with each other for their own personal gain. And almost above all of those things, he understood an awful amount about human psychology. It was not necessary that anyone should tell him what was in man because he knew what was in man. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them and responded to them in a way that he hoped would turn them to God. The Lord Jesus Christ knew and spoke about all of these things through the gospel. But you know, every time that he spoke about one of these things, it wasn't just for that purpose. He wasn't the economics teacher. He wasn't the farming instructor. He didn't take shepherd classes to help people learn how they should carry the sheep in the work health safety fashion over their shoulders so as not to injure themselves. Every time he spoke about any of these day-to-day -day occurrences and they are fields of interest for many of us, every time he drew it into a lesson about God. Every time he drew it into a spiritual sphere. So we could talk to Jesus about all of those things. And because of his interest in us personally, he would be aware of all of the things that we're doing in our lives. But what would Jesus like most to talk about? He most liked to talk about the word of God and his father. And as we understand it, we've been speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ as a priest. Here's a passage from Malachi to explain that. We would expect that the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of Yahweh of hosts. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ would most like to talk about. The spiritual lessons that he had read out of the Bible and absorbed. It was a habit of his to take the things that he had read out of the Bible and the things he understood about God and to speak about them. He was fulfilling this responsibility of a priest to keep the law. Just have a look here in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16 at one of the other symbols that we'll consider tonight. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth, his lips and his mouth, keep the law of God, out of his mouth, when a sharp two-edged sword. This has got to be talking about the things Jesus would talk about, hasn't it? It's an image about what's coming out of the Lord Jesus Christ's mouth. And it's described there as a two-edged sword. And you don't need me to put the next passage up on the screen, but you'll understand it because you, 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 you'll recognise it. Take the helmet of salvation, the Apostle Paul writes on the spiritual warrior, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So Jesus had this word and it was coming out of his mouth. And he describes it as a two-edged sword. And it tells us about something of the Lord Jesus Christ himself personally. When Jesus uses this title, it says this, 
or this is this symbol, I should say, of the two-edged sword, it says this, that Jesus was a Bible student. And we use that phrase, don't we, young people? You've heard it at the beginning of many introductions to lectures, that Christadelphians are Bible students, and that we base everything that we know and believe from the Bible. Well, I hope that's true. And the Lord hopes that it's true, because it was true for him. That's why he has this image, this, this vision here, of the sword, the two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And look at the context of this vision, just to give us a bit of proof about this. This is about the Lord Jesus Christ as a Bible student and his Bible awareness. Look at the context here. It's a man in long robes amongst lampstands. And we've already said that that's the picture of a priest. Where does that picture of a priest come from? Where is the Lord drawing that picture from so that we would recognise it? Well, we recognise it from the Old Testament, don't we? The Bible and the Scriptures as it was in the days of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in the book of Revelation, and this is a, a little statistical section here, so again, don't, please don't try to write all of this down. In the book of Revelation, just on the surface reading, I can find more than 99 tabernacle references in Revelation. And the reason I've got 99 plus is I couldn't fit numbers in that circle that were over 100. So it's definitely over 100, the number of references in Revelation to tabernacle and temple information. See there, slain lamb, the temple, trumpets, lampstands, the altar, the hidden manna that was inside the ark, that was in the most holy place, the Urim and the Thummim, the stones of decision by the priests, the tabernacle, the golden censers, the ark of the covenant. You go through all of that list there, you can see all the, all the scriptures there out of Revelation that refer to this Old Testament imagery. So the Lord understood about the law. He knew the law, didn't he, to be able to include all of those, all of those pictures uh, in his book of the Revelation. And when Brother Thomas wrote Eureka in five full volumes to explain the detail that the Lord had included in the book of Revelation, he put one of the early sections as linkages to all of the Old Testament prophets. And what he was trying to prove was that his interpretation and our, our interpretation of, of, of the Revelation was consistent with all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. And that these things from Revelation were in fact found their, their roots in the Old Testament. What he's done though, is he's helped us understand that the Lord knew all of that. He understood that. He understood Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, etc. Because he brings all of those details of the future and puts them into the book of Revelation. In fact, if you look at the back of Eureka and count up all the Old Testament references that Brother Thomas, has, Brother Thomas goes to to try to help us understand where the book of Revelation come from, 1,700 Old Testament references are quoted in the book of Eureka. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us on the tabernacle basis that the Lord understood the law and knew it well, and it tells us here that he understood the prophets. And so therefore we have the Old Testament encompassed. Just have a look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. He sent and signified it. Now we, we always interpret that word signified and we explain it to our friends in our public lectures that the book of Revelation is a book of visions and, and, and symbolic representations of things. But somebody had to think up what those pictures looked like. Somebody had to pick up the vision of the beast with a woman riding upon it and all of the thorns and the, all of the horns and the crowns. Somebody had to think up the image of the angel with the sickle that would, cast, that would, that would be able to reap. Who thought all of that visionary, who thought all of those visions up? Well, let's just look at how Brother Thomas translates that first verse. It makes it a little bit even clearer again. A revelation of Jesus anointed, which the deity committed to him to exhibit to his servants things which must speedily be accomplished and he indicated them by sign. Jesus did. It was the Lord Jesus Christ was given the future history of the world by his Father. And he said, how am I going to communicate this to my friends and my servants? I'll do it in these wonderful visions. And I'll do it in a way that gives them clues. Because I want them to be Bible students like me. And to go back and find where these symbols are in the Old Testament. And that's why he's written the book of Revelation in this way. 
Jesus was a Bible student. That's the lesson that we're trying to see here. Now just come back a few pages to first of Peter and chapter one. You see, all of those prophets that spoke in the Old Testament times spoke about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Peter gives us an insight here as to how much they understood about what they were saying. So you see, first of Peter chapter one and verse ten. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. The prophets spoke about the suffering and the glory of Christ, but they didn't always understand it precisely themselves. But they wanted to. They'd received the vision from God. They didn't understand everything that was there. They did understand it. Perhaps it was for a later time. He says that in verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister these things. So what did they do? They had a vision from God. They didn't understand all of it. What did they do? Well, Peter says in verse 10 there that they inquired. That's what the prophets did. They inquired and they searched diligently. What does it mean that the prophets inquired? Who would they inquire of? Who would they ask questions about this vision? If we take the example of Daniel, he asked back to God. I don't understand this vision. Help me out. Give me some more detail. And because Daniel was a man beloved of God, more detail came to him. And he asked more questions and more detail came. He asked more questions and Daniel and God said, finally, Daniel, enough. This is all I'm going to tell you. You'll stand in your lot at the end of the day, but I love you for asking those questions, Daniel. He inquired of God what those things were about. But not only did they inquire, they searched diligently. What did they search? Where did they search? We take Daniel again, his prophecy. He wrote that prophecy. We know specifically that he understood by books that in the prophecy of Jeremiah, 70 years was determined upon Jerusalem. So Daniel was a Bible student to try to understand for himself the visions that God had given to him. Now, if the prophets inquired and searched diligently, don't you think that the Lord would have as well? He came in the role of a prophet. He was the preeminent prophet. The Lord Jesus Christ would have inquired and would have searched diligently. In fact, you know, young people, the end of verse 12 tells us that even the angels look into these things. So we're in good company if we actually are Bible students. We're in good company. The Lord would have searched. He would have understood from a very young age. You would have seen him there with the lamp in the house in Nazareth, perhaps with a borrowed scroll from the synagogue, pouring over that in the night time to try to understand everything that he could about that word of God because it came from his father. Another statistical page, another statistical slide. The word, 26 times he says through the gospel. It is written 21 times. Haven't you ever read? Was this question to the, to the Pharisees and the scribes. He spoke about the scripture and the law. Everything that he was speaking about was a reflection of the things that he had learned from the scriptures. And we know that from the very first incident that we have of him, of his personal interactions, don't we? When he was 12 years old, he went down to the temple with his parents. It came to pass after three days of looking for him because they'd gone off and left him behind. They found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, hearing them and asking them questions. You see, inquiring, searching diligently, wanting to understand what he could about the scripture from anybody that could help him with that. And everybody that heard him was astonished at his understanding and his answers. The questions that he asked were not beginner questions. They weren't intermediate questions at a 12 year old. They were senior and deep questions. And they were amazed that he'd already absorbed enough scripture to be able to ask those questions on top of his, own, of his knowledge. Everyone was astonished at his understanding. In John chapter 5, he tells us and gives us this exhortation. Search the scriptures. I've done that. Search and inquire. Search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. He found about his life from reading in the scriptures. He understood that. Look, if you believe Moses, he said, you would have believed me because he wrote about me. 
If you believe not his writings, why would you believe my words? His custom or his habit uh, was to read the scriptures. You see, he came to Nazareth on this very well-known occasion where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, that's a statement of habit. It was his habit. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up for to read. It was his habit to be in the synagogue and to read. And there was delivered to him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of Yahweh is upon me. And we know that passage. And that's a picture up there of the actual scroll of Isaiah that was found in the Qumran caves. And that's the section right there where Jesus was actually reading from. I don't think he had the same scroll as that in Nazareth, but obviously it was the book of Isaiah. There's no chapter markings in those scrolls. There's no verse numbers. But it says that he found the place. That tells me that he was familiar with that scroll. In much the same way as we can be familiar with our Bibles. So hands up. If you know, and you may have different shaped Bibles than mine, so I can't tell if your answer's right or wrong, so just hands up if you know which side page and which side column of your Bible Genesis 3.15 is on. If you've got the same one as mine, without looking, I think it's on the left-hand page, on the left-hand column. And we know where Hebrews 11 verse 1 is, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. We know where that is, right? You see, this is, these are passages that we are familiar with in the Scripture, and because we continue to use the same physical Bible, we know where things are. We become familiar with them. In fact, on many occasions, we go, oh, someone's just quoted something, and I know that's something from the epistles of Paul, but I can't remember the chapter and verse number, but I know that I've only got that much to look at on this part of the Bible, and I can sort of flick through because I think it's down the bottom right-hand side. We do that because we become familiar with our Scriptures. That's what the Lord was like. Now, let me tell you something. The Isaiah scroll, as a scroll, not a page to anything, is quite an impressive document. And I need, a, I need a volunteer. And this is the only time I'm going to need a volunteer on the stage, but I do need one. And I haven't got a clock, so I can't tell whether I'm over time, so I need one quickly. So anyone down the front row here wants to just pop up here. You won't have to speak, but I need you to hide, hold something for me. Thank you. I've made a scroll of Isaiah. It's not beautiful. It hasn't got gold ribbing and all the rest of it. It's just a couple of bits of pressure pop. Uh, but it's the exact same size as the Isaiah scroll that was found in the Qumran caves. All right, so we just want to see how big that is. So if you can take that half, and we'll do this carefully because it's just on A4 paper. afterwards and see how hard it might be to actually find your place in a scroll that's just like that hasn't got the, the, the easier ways of finding things in our scrolls that tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ because of his habit in reading the scripture knew all about it it was a habit of his to read that scripture seven meters long 24 feet if you want to hear it in the old language the Lord Jesus Christ was a Bible student it was in his mind all the time it motivated him for many of the things that he did and it helped him understand what he needed to do every day of his life. Now, the hardest day of his life, we know that the word was very present in his mind. It's like you to come to, as you know, we'll put it on the screen, John chapter 19 and verse 28. The Lord here, he's been through that terrible night of betrayal. 
He's been through the beating and the lashing and the scourging. He's been through the mocking and the trial. He's in the state of being crucified. He's hanging on the cross. Out in the sun, amongst the mocking crowds. And what's going on in his mind? Well, I think that we learn from this passage that the word of God was sustaining him. His knowledge of the Bible was sustaining him. See, after this... Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. He'd seen the vinegar and the gall. He recollected the prophecy that had said that they'd given that to him, that they would give that to him. And his Bible student mind was saying, this is another thing that I need to do. And I don't think that this passage that says that the scripture might be fulfilled is inserted there by John to say, isn't this amazing? Here's another one of those things that was a fulfillment of scripture, that the Lord was thirsty and they gave him the vinegar mixed with God. I don't think that's what that's saying. I think this is telling us what's going on inside the the mind of the Lord. He said it so as to fulfill the scripture because that scripture was in his mind. Even at that point of his life, when he's on the cross in the middle of that terrible crucifixion, in the middle of that agony, he was aware of his need to fulfill that scripture, which it had been his habit his whole life to learn. And after he was resurrected, after the most wonderful event in his life, the most wonderful event that's occurred in the whole history of mankind, his resurrection to immortality, you can imagine the Lord Jesus Christ in the excitement that he's in with immortality now, none of the pain and the trouble that just three days before was a problem for him. He goes and meets his friends. He talks to them. What does he talk to them about? He doesn't pop up and say, it's me. He hides himself from them. He, he, he withdraws so they don't recognize him because he wants to give them a Bible class like they would never have ever had in their lives before. And oh, I wouldn't have been wonderful to be here on the way to Emmaus with his two friends who were sorrowing because of all the terrible things that had happened. And they thought that Jesus was going to be the Messiah. And he gives them a Bible class to say, you, you didn't understand, hear this again. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, like everything. This is a man who knew them like no one else, the things concerning himself. And when they heard that, my goodness, didn't they say to one another, Did not our heart burn within us? You've been to Bible studies like that, haven't you, young people, brothers and sisters, where you've gone, wow, I've just seen some amazing things out of the scripture, and it just fires you up. Imagine this. To understand the whole purpose of God as it focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, from him, the best Bible expositor that there will ever be, and while he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures, fulfilling, uh, uh, demonstrating to them how his life had fulfilled those scriptures which they did not understand. What an amazing Bible class that would be. It's because he was a Bible student. Every part of his life, as John 1 verse 14 tells us, was driven around the word. The word was made flesh. You could see it expressed in him personally. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That was his character. Jesus was a Bible student. Are we... Because if we are, then we're going to be sitting down here and we'll ask him a whole lot of questions about things that we haven't quite got to, that we haven't quite understood, but that we're always wanting to. And we'll be able to forge a great and a personal relationship with him because of his ability to answer our questions on those things. Now, I don't want you to be put off by the word student, particularly for those of you who have just finished year 12. You've been studying all year to get the results, which I understand from, from Uncle Justin's email just released just was earlier today, was, was very well done. But you've been studying all year, and that feels like really hard, draining stuff. Don't be put off by that to think that Bible study is going to be hard and draining stuff. Because if sometimes you think about it like that, you mightn't do it. So let me give you a definition of, uh, so that you can easily tell whether or not you're a Bible student and, whether or, and therefore not to be afraid to start. A good week of Bible study is any week in which you know more than you did in the week before about the Bible 
and that knowledge was gained from your own effort. That's the definition of a good Bible student. And anybody can do that, right? Anybody can say, okay, I'm going to learn something under my own effort out of the Bible this week that I didn't know before. If you do that, you'll be a Bible student. And eventually the fire of interest will build in you. And you'll get down to deeper and harder subjects because you'll be passionately interested in them. But don't be put off by the thought that you must understand Greek and Hebrew and all of those difficult things. They're great things to do, excellent tools. When you go to the school of the prophets, etc., if you choose to go there, or some of those other, other studies, because they're going to give you great techniques to help you expand your knowledge of the Bible. But a good week of Bible study is any week in which, under your own effort, you've increased your knowledge of the Bible. And you've got to do something with that knowledge, of course. It's not just all about knowledge, right? We've got to do something with that knowledge. That's why the Lord describes his Bible student knowledge as a sword. It's a double-edged sword. Now that image comes out of the Bible. It comes out of the Old Testament. Shall we have a look? Let's go back to Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3 has the story of Ehud and Eglon, that very fat man that's always humorous for us to think about when we're younger in Sunday school. And Eglon was, sorry, and Ehud was the left-handed judge uh, that God raised up in those days. Look what happens in Judges 3 verse 15. When the children of Israel cried unto Yahweh, Yahweh raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gerah, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. But... He had made him a dagger, which had two edges of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. And when they frisked him down, they looked on the left thigh, and they didn't find it. And so they brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present, but he himself, Ehud, turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king who said, keep silence, don't let anyone know, let's go somewhere private. And all that stood by him went out from him. And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlour, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he rose out of his seat, and Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And all this gory detail, isn't it? The haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade, so that he couldn't even get the dagger back. He couldn't draw the dagger out of his belly. And the dirt came out. There's a two-edged sword that Ehud had made. You see how he describes that sword in verse 20? Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. The word message there in most other places is translated word. I've got the word of God here, Eglon. It's a two-edged sword strapped on my, left th- on my right thigh. And what does it do? It killed the enemy. It went in so deep and it showed exactly what that man was like. It was full of dirt. The dirt came out. All of his intestines all burst out on the ground. That's what the sword of the word can do. Let's put this passage up on the screen. This is the Apostle Paul, I think, perhaps speaking of the same instance. The word of God is alive, it's quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What do we want to do with this Bible knowledge that we've gained? It's got to cut. That's what a sword is about. It's got to cut deep with the intention of getting dirt out, because that's what the first of these swords was used for. There's a surgical precision there with the words in Hebrews, isn't there? The dividing asunder of soul and spirit, a careful cutting down between what we might look like in our lives on the outside and our actual underlying motivations. It's got to get down to the joints. So just have a look at your left wrist if you're you're a right-handed sword person. Have a look at your left wrist 
and just feel around there where the joints are, where, the, where your wrist joins up. And now imagine getting a sharp sword and digging it in there and then twisting it so that you would divide that joint up. That's what is it there, isn't it? Dividing asunder the joints. Are you, are you shuddering in behind your belly buttons? Because that's what happens to me when I think about gruesome injuries. Sorry for giving you that picture. And, and then it's the dividing of the marrow. That means you've actually got to slice all the flesh off your arm, get down to the bone, and then the sword's so sharp that when you run it along the bone like that, you can then splay the bone open so you can see the marrow in it. And it happens while you're alive. It's got to cut deep the sharp blade poking into the joints and separating them. You put those two passages together, the surgical precision of Ehud's blade, we've got to let the sword sink so deep into our minds that the dirt comes out. Just, just quickly come across to Matthew chapter 4. What did the Lord do with his sword? What did the Lord do with the word? Well, in Matthew chapter 4, he was accosted by an enemy of God that wanted to put doubt into the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're the son of God, how about you make these stones bread? And the Lord used that sword to send that thinking packing. Because he was questioned in verse 4 and answered, it's written, and in verse 7 he was questioned, and he said, it is written again. And in verse 10 he said, it is written, thou shalt worship Yahweh thy God only. He used that sword to dispatch the lust of the, pride, lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. We've all got those things marked in there, haven't we, from, John, from first of John? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's what the sword is there for, to dispatch them. It is written. That's what we've got to do with our Bible knowledge. That's the practical application of it. Um, just come over another chapter. Matthew chapter 5. And now the Lord is talking to us, not talking to someone who he's holding the sword with. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 27 to 29. You've heard, he says, that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Get the sword out. Plunge it in. Get the dirt out. That's what he says, doesn't he? Verse 29, if thy right eye offends you in this way, pluck it out. Get the sword, turn it around in your hand so it's facing back to your own head, poke it in your eye and, 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 and get your eye out because it's going to kill you if you don't. You won't make it into the kingdom. It's more profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, well, you've got the sword, because maybe you're a right-handed person, will switch hands and cut that hand off. And do it yourself. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. It's profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. You see what the Lord is saying here? Get that sword and cut it into us. Make an impact with it. Make it change the way that we respond to the situations in which sin could arise. Now, I think it's rather... Interesting that he should use the eyes and the right hand here. I was sitting in my study preparing for this and I looked down at the desk and this is what I saw. Nothing remarkable, I guess, there. You can see my right hand over on the right-hand side there. Who else uses the mouse with their right hand? All right. Who else points their eyeballs at the material that is presented to us by these people from the world. Google and Facebook and Microsoft and the Apple Store and Netflix and YouTube and Amazon, News Corp, iView, car sales, real estate.com, TripAdvisor. Every single one of those business models is driven by wanting to get your eyeballs on there for them to look at it. And the eyes are connected to the right hand. So when the Lord says, if your eye is offending you, pluck it out and send an email to WebShield to block YouTube if that's where your waste of time comes in. Or send an email to who your provider is or your parents to lock down the sites that are causing you a problem. I haven't even put up there the evils of pornography, etc., and lust, which our Lord might, might, might have um, intended here when he talks about adultery and looking on a woman. We have to take practical action. 
things aren't going to change otherwise. If our eyes are, are not corrected or what we're looking at and we let our hands do what they want to do, we're going to be in the situation the Lord says here. We've got to let the sword cut in. And it'll be hard and it'll be tough on occasions, but we've got to do that so the dirt can come out. And the word of God has to have that impact on us. You see, look, there were, there were people in the day of the Lord who were cut to the heart in the days of the apostles. When they heard that, the word was preached to them, they were cut to the heart. And when they heard Stephen speaking, they were cut to the heart. And they tried to get rid of the pain. They didn't try to change anything. They thought, how can we get rid of these apostles? We've killed off Jesus. How do we kill the apostles as well? And then they went and stoned Stephen to get rid of that irritant. They gnashed on him with their teeth and took him out of the city. They weren't willing to allow the teaching of the Lord to affect them. They weren't willing to allow the impact of the word to come upon them. And there were some of them that were even worse, the Lord said, and they were the lawyers, that they tried to stop other people learning about the scripture. I hope none of us hear like that. You know, sometimes we have that conversation after a study and you might be in a little group and the conversation might have drifted very quickly away from the study and you might want to bring it back to that because there was something there that you thought was interesting and you try to do that but the, the group's just not with you. It's, there's a bit of pressure there. Oh, no, well, no, we're past that. We're talking about the cricket now. Let's not be those people. Let's not, stop, let's not be the ones that stop others hearing about the word of God or wanting to listen to the word of God. Here's the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Morning by morning, he said, God opens my ears and I'm not rebellious. I'm dying to hear what God has to say in his word. That's the spirit that the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to be about. What should we do with our Bible knowledge? We've got to make it powerful on us to, to, to remove sin from our lives. We've got to do positive things with it too. And I need to skip very quickly through this one because I can see from my clock that uh, Brother John will be coming and having words with me afterwards if I don't sit down in a few minutes. But here's the positive thing that the Word of God should be doing with us. You see, um, we might just turn across a few more pages to Matthew chapter 15, where the scribes and the Pharisees had a problem with the disciples because they were eating without washing their hands. That was a tradition of the elders they were breaking there, you see. They had a problem with that. Verse 2, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, You're transgressing the commandment of God by your tradition. God commanded, Honour thy father and mother. And he that curseth mother or father, let him die the death. But you say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift, or the other translation, the other record has it, Corban, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honour not his mother or father, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Now, what was this Corban thing? Very quickly it was, I'm a wealthy man because of all the effort that I've put into my life. I've made a fair bit of money, and look, mum and dad probably need a bit of help. But if I write my will out to say that when I'm dead, everything of my treasure is to go to the temple... Well, I really can't give anything to mum and dad, can I? Because that'd be like robbing God. Because I've already promised everything to go to the temple. So we'll call that Corban. It's a gift to God. Sorry, dad. I, just, I know your roof's fallen in. I, I, I just can't help you out. That's what the situation was that the Lord was dealing with here. It was a tradition that, that the elders allowed. And the Lord, there's two words here that are really important. You see the end of verse 6. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect. It's supposed to have an effect, the word of God. It's supposed to have an effect on us. What is the effect? Well, we've got it on the screen. Because the Lord says in another place that the two greatest commandments on which hang all the law and the prophets are these, that thou shalt love Yahweh thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbour as thyself. You see how this Corban practice made that purpose of the word of God of none effect? Because it effectively allowed somebody to say, well, you know what, I love God so much that I can't possibly love anyone else. Sorry. No, both of those commandments have to be met. That's the effect that the word has got to have on us. We've got to love God so much that we are willing to dig the sword in and get the dirt out because we know God doesn't want us to do that. But we've got to love God as well. 
so that we love those that are around us. And we'll speak some more about the way in which the Lord expressed and experienced that uh, over the rest of our study series. What else should we do with our Bible knowledge? We've looked at one of Jesus' habits with the word. He was a Bible student, as should we. It should help us to combat sin, as it did with him. It should have the effect of us loving God and loving our neighbour, as it did with him. And these ideas will come to as I said a bit later, but Jesus had another habit in relation to the word of God. Having obtained his knowledge of the Bible, he gave it away. His other habit was to teach in the hope of helping people combat sin, of helping people love God, of helping people love each other. You see, here's, we're just flicking through these, but here's the passage again. He arose from thence and cometh into the coasts of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. The people resort unto him again, and as he was wont... As was his custom, he taught them again. That's what Malachi tells us we need to be doing amongst ourselves, young people, brothers and sisters. As we learn week by week that little extra from our own effort in our Bible study, we've got to share it with each other. We've got to light the fire of interest in each other. Then they that feared Yahweh spake often one to another. That's the other habit of our Lord Jesus Christ with his Bible study that's the other habit that we should promote. That's the other thing that we can do to help each other as we wait for Jesus to come. He's going to come. We've seen those scriptures. He's going to gather us together. He's going to sit down next to us. And hopefully if we've been reading the word and teaching each other, we'll recognise him and he'll recognise us because we'll have been doing what he did. And we'll have plenty of things to talk about together then. I'd like to thank our brother Anthony for his words to us this evening. There are no physical descriptions of our Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel records. How therefore will we recognise our Lord Jesus Christ when he returns? What will we speak to him about? How can we have a relationship with him? Well, tonight we learnt about our Lord that he is a Bible student. And so if we want to know him, to build a relationship with him, then we also have to be Bible students now so that God's word might cut deep into us and help to develop our characters to be like our Lord. And so we look forward to the remainder of our studies, God willing, as we seek to learn more about the man, Christ Jesus. We'll conclude tonight with a hymn and a prayer, uh, following which I'll ask that you remain seated for the announcements. And so let us now conclude with hymn 286.
Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We come before thee, Father, praying for the time when we will be redeemed, when Israel will be restored, and when the whole world will be saved. With the return of thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to this earth. And so we pray that thou would send him back soon. In the meantime, Father, we, we thank thee for blessing us in so many ways for the time that we have this evening to share with our brethren and sisters and young people who have the same hope that we do. We thank thee for blessing us with food and shelter and clothing, remembering that so many others have far less than we do. And we seek for thy continued blessing to be upon us and upon all of our brethren and sisters worldwide. Help us all to build up a relationship with our great high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ, by being Bible students like he is, so that we might be prepared as the collective bride of Christ to meet our bridegroom when he returns, and that when he returns we might recognise him as the man Christ Jesus whom we long to meet. And so, Father, we leave all things in thy care, asking this prayer through our future King, our Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our end of year studies. Fantastic to have you here again for the next 10 days or so for another end of year studies, and we are sure you will love your time with us. Uh, thank you to those who were involved in the colour run last night. It was an absolutely fantastic start to our end of year studies, and a special thanks to those in the committee involved in planning that. Thank you to Uncle Anthony for his words to us tonight, and to Steve, Isaac, Chloe, and to Azza for his brilliant demonstration. Isn't Azza just a great guy? It just, I cannot speak highly enough of Azza, tell you what. <laughs> End of your studies programs, you can collect them in the foyer should you need one. Recordings, you can visit the one-stop shop to get them on an email or a USB. The mother's room is to my left, just down that hallway. The toilets are in the foyer, also on my left. And please leave this building by 10.30 p.m. tonight. The website, sypadelaide.com forward slash EOYS, is where you can get all your end of your studies details. You can download and view the studies, get talk recordings, locations, etc., etc. You can also sign up for what we call our SYP Remind Me texts, which is where we will send you a text message reminding you of what's on with a link to a location, all kinds of stuff. Plus, as you may have been aware, we are live streaming all of these studies, and if you had the great benefit of being subscribed, you would, would have already got a little notification. But if not, you can jump on our YouTube page, like Matt, ring WebShield, say, unblock the suburban part of YouTube, and then <laughs> jump on here, hit the subscribe button, and then you'll get little alerts. If you can't make it to one, it'll send you the link so you can watch it straight away. You don't have to go hunting for it, deal with all that YouTube rubbish. So don't forget to do that when you get home, or right now. The One Stop Shop is here again with everything you could possibly need from ice creams and drinks and lollies. And of course, they have ice cold limited edition suburban water for only $1. So do not forget to grab a bottle. This is the only time for the whole year you can get a bottle. The next six studies plus two picnics. That's eight opportunities at limited edition water that you will not get anywhere else. Of course, also there's barista made coffee and ginger beer for just $3. Lemonade Icy Pole is on special tonight for just $1. We're calling it the EJ Birthday Special, so don't forget to grab that tonight. Lemonade Icy Pole, just $1. 
Of course, our annual young people's outing, we were, we were sitting at the committee meeting trying to figure out what to do. Like, it's just such pressure to know what to do at a young people's outing. And so many people had different ideas. Particularly, we were fighting over whether we'd go to the beach or go to the botanic gardens. And then, get this, Uncle Pete stood up and said, why don't we do both? And you notice the little gleam off his head there? Yeah, <laughs> that's particularly my favourite effect of this sludge. <laughs> anyway, so hence the young people's outing is the botanic and beach bonanza. And unless you came to Colour Run, tonight is your first chance to book in. It is just $15. You pay at the bookings desk. You just look for all the botanic posters, botanic and beach bonanza posters, and that's where you book in. One thing to note, if you have already booked in at the Colour Run, you still need to grab your receipt. So head up to the desk tonight. We know you've already paid, so we won't hustle you for more money. But just grab your receipt, because you'll need that if you show up. Well, you will need that, or we... What's going on? Oh, who knows? Okay, you will need that, or we will hassle you for more money. So don't forget to grab your receipt. Um, right, this. Last night, Priscilla said to me, end of year studies has kicked off nicely. The fundraiser was great, the colour run. Everything was so colourful, it was real fun. For the young people this year, there is something new-ish. A botanic and beach bonanza. Yes, this is true-ish. You will need to be a physical specimen, bring your best running shoes, and don't forget to download WhatsApp for all the riveting clues. The outing is so soon. Book in tonight. Don't wait. You don't want your friends to say you should have been there, mate. So don't forget to book in tonight for the botanic and beach bonanza, just $15, and of course there's credit card facilities available, which I should mention the shop has credit card as well, just FYI. Um, last thing, tomorrow morning is our next study, study two. Brother Anthony speaking to Believing the Man. The full details are on the screen. One thing to note is a collection will be held following that study to help cover the cost of our activities here. And then following the study, we'll have our first family picnic, family picnic one here at PAC. There will, of course, be the sausage sizzle lunch. You can get one for $1.50 or, or the super special price of 10 for $10, so don't just bring a $10 note. I, it, you would be wasting your time to do anything but a $10 note, even if you have to buy some for a friend or something, it's well worth it. Absolutely stunning weather predicted for tomorrow. There's cricket, gym, gym sports. Any sports you wanna play in a gym, I guess that would be all sports. Could, well, probably not swimming actually, but most sports could be played in a gym. Soccer, tennis, and much more. So. Uh, we, oh, and then that night, there's a young people's supper at the Kempsters. Don't forget, it's 15 plus, so you have to be over 15 to come. Text the number on the screen for the address, and it's a gold coin donation. So we will see you tomorrow morning, right back here in this hall at 11.30. And now our beautiful meditation item group are going to close with a meditation item.